When we read the scripture a few minutes ago from Galatians chapter 6, 1 rather, verses 6 through 10, as you were thinking about this, I want you to consider, do you think that the, the Apostle Paul, after he said these words to the Galatian brethren, reminding them that they had strayed from the truth and that, that they um, had uh, begun to uh, uh, believe others, that were teaching a gospel, a different gospel, in fact, the way he puts it. And he cautioned them. He said, if anybody else, though it be we or an angel or anyone, should teach any other gospel than that which we preach to you, let him be a curse. Do you think after the Apostle Paul said these words that he said, oh, I'm sorry I said that. I didn't mean to be so harsh. No. He didn't. We don't find any record of that. Neither do you find any record when Jesus was still conducting his ministry. Take, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. Do you think that there's anything in the Sermon on the Mount after Jesus gave it that he turned around and said, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. No, he didn't. Anytime the truth was presented whether it was from Jesus or any of the apostles, no apology was given. I want us to look at tonight, it seems like a rather harsh title, doesn't it? Things that we should not apologize for. But there are things in life that we should not apologize for, especially things concerning things of truth and things that uh, we have been given charge by God's Word to do. We shouldn't apologize for those things. I think you'll see what we mean as we go further. There are some things in life, of course, we know that we should apologize for. The title doesn't indicate that we should not be apologetic. It's just that there are certain things that we cannot apologize for. As Christians, we should not apologize. What we do need to apologize for is sin and sinful acts. And I think that all of us understand that there are certain things that involve those things, sin, sinful acts, that we should apologize for. We should be sorry for those things. Hypocrisy. Should that ever happen? And we're guilty of hypocrisy. And someone is nice enough to point that out to us in a loving manner. You know, we should apologize for that. In fact, we should repent of it. And when we're talking about sin, too, not only should we apologize, again, we should repent of that as well. Causing division. That's something that not only we should apologize for, but we should repent of as well. And we must if we're going to be right with God. Anything that we do that casts reproach upon the church put you a blemish, a spot, or that would be something that would, would hinder the work of the church. Something that we might do that would cause others to look down upon the church. We need to apologize for that. Not only do we need to apologize, but we need to repent of that. Anything that we would do that would cause us to become a stumbling block. A stumbling block that would hinder the truth. A stumbling block that would stand in the way of the church growing. Harm harm or damage the church. That's something that we should apologize for. And not only should we apologize, but we need to repent of that as well. Let's look at the definition of apology. As it is defined, it says it's an acknowledgement of fault. Isn't that what we've just been talking about? Acknowledging things that we are at fault? An acknowledgement of fault or offense or being grateful. Or I guess you could say ungrateful even. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says here to the Galatian brethren, he says, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? 
There are many examples we could think that would pertain to that. Apollos, that he pointed out it, that he pointed out to the Corinthian brethren because many of them were following after Apollos. Some of them after Paul, and they were causing division because of that. When Paul pointed that, that out to the Corinthian brethren and pointed them out that they should be following Christ, not Paul, not Apollos, not anyone else. Did he apologize for that? Certainly not. Priscilla and Aquila. Also, when, when uh, Paul met up with them and they were teaching others about the gospel of Christ. Some who had been, had been following after the baptism of John the Baptist. But yet they were taught a more perfect way. Was there an apology made for that? For telling someone the truth? That it had been in error? No. Well, then that brings us to the question. What should we not apologize for? Well, I think first of all, back up. We should not, first of all, apologize for taking a firm stand for the Bible. There have been people that no doubt have, have read something from the Bible and then someone says, well, I don't like that. You know, hurt my feelings. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, well, I didn't mean to say that like that. We should never apologize for the truth. We should never apologize for God's word. We should never compromise on that word just to suit someone else who may not like what we read. We need to take a, stern, a firm stand for the Bible and not apologize on that. Let's look, if you will, and you have your Bibles with me. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and beginning with uh, verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fable. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. Do you think the Apostle Paul later apologized for those words? No, I don't think he did. Nothing written concerning that, and we know that he didn't. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, here the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian brethren, Be on your guard and stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage and be strong. Did he apologize for that? Certainly not. We must also call Bible sins by their names and not be so apologetic. Homosexuals are homosexuals. They're not gays. Don't care what the world calls them. They are homosexuals according to God's Word. And we don't need to apologize for that. A prostitute is a prostitute. They're not call girls, as the world might try to glamorize it. The Bible calls them prostitutes. These are sinful things that we're talking about, that the Bible names, and we are to name them by those names. We shouldn't be ashamed to name them by those names. That's what the Bible calls them. The Bible calls a murderer a murderer, not just someone who has taken a life. They're murderers. Haters of God, as the Bible puts it. But the world sometimes says, they're, oh, they're just rebels. They're just rebellious people. No, they're haters of God. 
those that would twist and distort the Word of God to suit themselves, those that would cast a, a, a dark image upon the Word of God, those who would seek to destroy the Word of God and what it stands for. They are haters of God. They're not rebels. Inventors of evil, as the Bible speaks of them. Today, some people in the world says, oh, that's just entertainment, don't you know? No, it's not entertainment. It's inventors of evil, and that's what the Bible calls them, and we don't need to apologize for that. A drunkard is a drunkard, not someone who has a problem or likes to have a good time. No, the Bible calls them drunkards. And we don't need to apologize for that. That's what the Bible calls them. Yeah, but Joe, you, you can offend somebody real easy like that. Well, bless their little heart. But the Bible still says it's wrong. And we need to call it what the Bible says. An extortioner is an extortioner. Not someone who cheats a little bit, as the world would call it. They're an extortioner. They cheat, yes. But the Bible calls them extortionists. Adultery is still adultery. It's not an affair or a relationship. The Bible says it's adultery. And it's wrong. And we shouldn't be ashamed to call it that. But we try to tone things down a little bit, don't we? Oh, Joe, now don't, don't call it adultery. That's such a harsh word. Let's just call it a fair or, you know, a relationship of some type. No, it's wrong. It's adultery. And we shouldn't apologize for that. That's what the Bible calls it. Lying is not half truth, as some people would lead you to believe it is. Well, don't call it a lie. That's so harsh. That sounds so... I'm sorry, that's what the Bible calls it. A liar is a liar. Revelation 21.8, some of the very people that Revelation 21.8 says will not enter the kingdom of God is those who lie. Fornication is still fornication. It's not enjoying life. Again, it's not any type of relationship. It's fornication. Oh, that's such a bad word. Let's tone it down a little bit. Yeah, that's what the world says. They tone it down to the point where it doesn't seem so bad anymore. But the Bible says it's bad. It's, it's sinful. It's something that no one should be involved in, especially a child of God. And we should never apologize for that. I like what the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 6.10. He said so many things about because of the Israel during that time had fallen into the same sort of mindset that we have today. Toning things down and, and saying, oh, well, it's not so bad. If it's not so bad, how can it be good? It can't. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 6, 10, 6 and verse 10. The word of the Lord is a reproach to them. He's talking about Israel at this time. See, they had become like many today. When you say things that, like the Bible puts it, when you call Bible sins by Bible names, you put it direct to people, it reproaches some of them. They don't like that. But that's what happened during Jeremiah's day. He says it was a reproach to them, the word of the Lord. They have no delight in it. You know, it's, it's kind of, well, I'm not going to say it's strange, but I've thought for a long time some of, the, some of the very things that the world is caught up in today that it says that God's Word plainly says is a sin, such as homosexuality, such as adultery, such as many other sins that people today seem to think is not so bad, the world says it's not so bad. I've often thought, you know, it's only a matter of time till somebody comes along 
And they're going to seek to change God's Word completely to suit their lifestyle. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't know if you've been keeping up with some of the things that are transpiring in the world today, but that's already happening. There are many people who are seeking to rewrite the Bible to where these things don't seem so bad anymore. Why? Because the very same thing that Jeremiah says here in Jeremiah 6.10, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. It smacks at their lifestyle, if you would. So in order to justify that, they have to change the word of God. Well, that's nothing new. Jeremiah says they tried to do that during his days, and it didn't work. God has never tolerated those who would not respect His Word, those who would not be obedient to His message, those that would not be obedient to His law, those that would not respect what God is trying to do for them in effort to try to get them to live in a way that God would be acceptable to God. He didn't do it during the days of Noah. He certainly didn't do it during the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, the Apostle Peter talks about that very thing. He said that God didn't spare the angels of old that rebelled against God. He cast them out of heaven. He didn't spare those during the days of the flood who refused to obey His word, refused to come into the ark of safety, who ignored Noah and his message from God. He didn't spare them. He didn't spare those of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when they would not repent and that only a few souls was saved from those evil cities. In fact, four, and then ended up only three. God has never tolerated such. If you think, or you know of anyone who thinks, that they can do those things that we mentioned before that are sinful before God, and that somehow or other they can be as disobedient as they choose, and they can choose not to, well, even obey God's will, or reject it, or neglect it, or ignore it. If they think that they can do that, and that somehow or other, God's going to make an exception of them. That God's going to make an exception on their part. Oh, well, you know, I don't want anybody else doing that, but it's okay if you do it. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. If it did, and God made an exception on your part, and all these others that we read about in the day of Noah, all the way to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, all the way up till today, those that God has certainly said would be punished with everlasting punishment, who disobey Him and do not regard His will, God's not going to make an exception for you. If He did, He would have to go back. And while we're talking about apologizing, He would have to apologize to the people before the flood. He would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah residents as well as a host of others, and it, that's not going to happen. We know that's not even rational to think that. There's no exceptions. We must obey God. Do not apologize for standing for the truth. If you forget everything else I said tonight, remember that. Don't apologize for standing for the truth. Be bold. Don't apologize for the one church. Oh, here's one here. Now today, there are many that will do that. There are many places where you cannot teach in the Lord's church I'm talking about. There are many congregations when you cannot mention the word, the one church. We don't talk about that. Don't mention that. Don't bring that up. You, you offend somebody. You might run some people off. 
And many don't want to mention it. And some, when they do mention the one church, turn right around and apologize for what they just said. We should never apologize for the one church. Again, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's begin at verse 4 through verse 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Here we have the word one mentioned. Now then, don't, don't turn me off just yet. Colossians chapter 1. Turn with me over there to Colossians, if you will. In Colossians chapter 1, let's look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Now then, let's look at chapter 3 of Colossians and verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which is also, in which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let's also look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. I think we can clearly see that the word one is not something that we should be ashamed to use. Certainly not something that we should apologize for since God's word teaches it. I want to go a little further. Some would say, and I probably would say most people sitting here tonight have heard this at one time or other. Some would say, well, you know, one church is just as good as another. Now, they didn't say one congregation is as good as another, but one church is as good as another. Or maybe join the church of your choice. It's almost as if the Bible means nothing to them. Where did you get that? Well, my preacher said that. Or someone in my church said that. Well, it's not your church. Church belongs to Christ. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. Belongs to Christ. Oh, well... That's, uh, that's just sarcastic, Joe. Don't say it. I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. When I said I'm sorry, I wasn't apologizing either. So don't, 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 don't get that thought there. That's not what I was saying. Jesus said, I will build my church. In Matthew 16, verse 18. Don't apologize for the one church. The Bible teaches it. Stand for it. Something else we shouldn't apologize for. God ordained worship. Now, I put this down because I see so many people today saying, well, you know, we do this over here at our church. And there's nothing wrong with that. Well, did God ordain it? Well, I don't know. I guess He did. Seems to be okay with, with all of our church members. Our preacher thinks it's okay. Did God ordain it? Can't answer that question. Don't apologize for God ordained worship. By definition, the word worship is an allegiance to being loyal, devotion, and reverence. We shouldn't apologize for Bible preaching. 
Someone says, well, I don't like that lesson your preacher preached Sunday night. I tell you, that was, there were some things there that just offended me. What things was it? Some of those things he read out of the Bible just downright offended me. Don't apologize for that. Don't apologize for Bible preaching. You know, when I attended church there Sunday, you all didn't play a single instrument. Nothing. All you did was sing. Don't apologize for that because that's what the Bible instructs us to do is sing and make melody in our heart. You know, when you all had communion, that some people seem to be pretty emotional about that. Well, you should be because you're thinking about Christ's death and his suffering. Think about the lesson we had this morning. Think about the lesson that Brock presented a couple of Sunday nights ago about the crucifixion. Think about those things. Think about the suffering that our Lord went through. Yeah, it can be emotional. There's nothing wrong with shedding a tear. I've seen many people do that during communion. Nothing wrong with that. It just shows that your heart and your mind is on the right thing. Well, you know, someone down there, they prayed a prayer, and that prayer lasted for 20 minutes. Y'all shouldn't allow that. Shouldn't allow too long of prayers. Yeah, well, I guess we probably need to tell Jesus about that in Luke 16 and verse 12, where he went and prayed all night long. Do we apologize for our giving? Do we? We should never apologize for any type of Bible worship. God ordained worship. The only thing the Bible says to us in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthian brethren, instructed them that they should do things decently and in order. But in following the Bible concerning these things, these acts of worship, don't apologize for Bible worship. Don't do it. There's another subject. Don't apologize for needing workers. I've heard that sometimes take place where a congregation would say, we need workers. We need Bible teachers. We need someone to do other. We need someone to lead prayer. We need someone to read scriptures. We need someone to visit. And then turn around and say, well, I hope we don't hurt anybody's feelings. We're awful sorry for that. Don't apologize for that. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul reminded, well, assuming the Apostle Paul wrote the Roman letter, and I think we all probably agree on that. In Romans 12 and verse 7, he said that teachers ought to teach. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Don't apologize. It, certainly the elders and others who have the responsibility of getting people together to do various works. If someone doesn't want to help, that's them. But don't apologize for asking them. I've heard that happen, though, sometimes. Ask someone to help with the work. Oh, I can't do that. I don't want to. Well, I'm so sorry I asked you. Don't be sorry. Sorry is because they refuse to cooperate. What about Matthew chapter 25, the story of the talents? We all remember that story and how that Jesus said to one he gave five, the one he gave two, the other one he gave one. The one who had the one talent could have used that one talent. And that can be said for a lot of people who may say, well, I can't do everything. Can you do one thing? If you can do one thing and do that well, then do it. 
You know what happened to the others? The one who had five talents. Now, Joe, that's talking about money. I know it's talking about money, but it also means something else too, doesn't it? The one who had five talents, they gained five more, didn't they? The other one, they doubled theirs. The person who had the one talent, instead of using that one talent, they buried it. Because they're a lot of, like a lot of other folks. Well, I can only do one thing and I won't be missed. I'm not important, so I just won't do that. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says to Timothy, The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. Also, Paul said, don't apologize, Timothy. You commit those things to faithful men so they can teach others as well. Soul winners, people who are involved in evangelistic efforts to, to win souls. And one says, well, I don't know about that. Well, I think it's the proverb writer that says, he that wins the souls is wise. You want to be wise, don't you? Well, he says win souls. Try to win souls. Teach. Teach, in other words. Acts 8 and verse 31. The eunuch said to Philip, when Philip asked him, do you understand what you've just read? He said, how can I accept some man guide me or someone guide me? He needed someone to teach him. Where would we be today? Where would you be today? If no one cared enough to teach you. Oh, I'm sure maybe many of you heard a lot of good sermons. Maybe attended a lot of good Bible classes. But some of you are Christians to this very day because someone, some individual took time out to teach you, to encourage you. That was that spark that ignited that fire within you to become a Christian. Servant of God. Visitation. Don't apologize for that. James 1 and verse 27 says we should visit the fatherless and the widows. And certainly we should visit all that we have opportunity to. But James says especially the fatherless and the widows. It all comes down to this. A working church is a growing church. So don't apologize for asking someone to help with the work of the church. There's nothing to apologize there for. And finally, don't apologize for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You mean there's people that does that? Absolutely. There's people that will read the truth and then as we mentioned before in the lesson, someone will say, well, that offends me. I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry, that's what the Bible says. Have you ever had someone who maybe you read a simple scripture like Mark 16 and verse 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned or shall be damned, as it says. And someone says, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry, that's what the Bible says. I'm not apologizing for it either when I say that. Don't ever say, well, we just won't read that anymore. We won't talk about that anymore. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, listen to what he said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Couldn't prove it by me because some people are ashamed enough they don't want to read it. They don't want to teach it. They don't want to mention it to anyone. Are you ashamed of it? Is that what it is? The Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He didn't have to say that, did he? He put his life on the line. He was willing to preach the truth whether it cost his very life or not. He was willing to preach the, preach the truth whether people liked it or not. He says... For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greeks. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. 
we shouldn't be ashamed of it either. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, I want us to look at verse 8 here in 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 8. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, the Apostle Paul says, nor of me, his prisoner. Shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. We shouldn't be ashamed of those who proclaim it and have suffered because of it. There are people right now in our century, in our time, who are dying simply because they're Christians. And they're not going to deny it. When they're faced with the choice, deny it or die, they choose death. Why? Because they're not ashamed to be a Christian. They're not ashamed of the gospel. And they would rather die than deny it. That happens right now during the very days that we live in. You might be thinking, in this country? No, not so much. Well, it possibly could, but more so in other countries. But it's coming to this country, so get ready for it. You may be faced with that very thing. Deny the gospel, deny God's word, deny that you're a Christian, or die. Which would you choose? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, I want us to read that. Second Thessalonians 1, verses 8 through 10. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is afterwards working the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish. Because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, and that they might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those are those that are ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of God's word. They would rather believe a lie than the truth. I believe it's the prophet Isaiah during his day. Some of the very people during that time told the prophet, said, don't tell us the truth. Speak soothing words to us. Lie to us. That was people then. And there are many today that feel the same way. Notice the scripture we just read. What would happen to those who have pleasure in unrighteousness? Don't apologize for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There may be sins that we need to apologize for. Whether it be sins against God or our fellow man. But may we never apologize for the Bible, God's word. May we never apologize for the church of our Lord. May we, may we never apologize for ordained worship the way that God has set it forth and the way that we should obey. May we never apologize for needing workers in the vineyard of the Lord. And may we never apologize for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight, if you're not a Christian... Here's God's plan of salvation. Romans 10 and verse 17, as well as in Mark 12 and verse 29, reminds us that we need to hear the word of the Lord. We need to believe that word, John 20, verse 31, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. We need to be willing to repent or to change our direction in life, Acts 2 and verse 38. 
as well as in Luke 13 and verse 3. We need to be willing to confess Christ before men. Romans 10, 9 and 10, as well as in Matthew 10 and verse 32. And then we need to be willing to be baptized according to the will of our Lord, according to what the Bible says. Mark 16 and verse 16. Acts 2 and verse 38. Galatians 3 and verse 27 reminds us that we are baptized into Christ. Acts 2 and verse 47 tells us that the Lord will add us to His church. We are to live godly lives once we become Christians. We're not to go back to the same life we had before. But we're to live godly lives. Need some direction about that? Well, 2 Peter 1 verses 5 through 11 gives us those directions. We're, these things are to be working, to be growing in our life. I've always said if you can take 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 11 and look at those things that we need to be adding to our life and you look and you say, well, I don't have any of those things. And you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years, maybe longer, and you tell me none of these things are active in your life? What things is that? Well, I want you to go home tonight and look at 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 11. Write those things down to where you can see them. Most of all, we're to live faithful to the end, till death, Revelation 2 and verse 10 tells us that. Are you ready tonight to stand before God? Remember what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. Are you ready to stand before God this very night? If this is your last night on earth, one day you will stand before God. Are you prepared are you ready?